Dominika and I'm the CEO of OMG Karkeri and I'd like to welcome you to our uh, episode uh, interview with review today in which we will be hosting uh, Saman Darkan, uh, the CTO and co-founder of Kitopi, one of the leaders in uh, food tech space. Uh, Sam, thank you so much uh, for accepting our invitation. We are so glad to have you here. Um, we had already the chance to, to meet each other uh, during the pandemic where uh, we were uh, hosting you at the virtual funders breakfast at uh, one of the episodes uh, ran by OMG KRK. So I'm glad that we can finally meet face to face. And uh, that was one of the most popular episodes at that time. And we decided that it would be nice to continue the conversation and ask you what has changed since that time. Because uh, when we met, you were at the, I don't know, 60 million round and B series. And now you are at the C series and uh, we're from a far massive, uh, bigger uh, round. So I'm sure that a lot has changed. But uh, for those of, uh, of our viewers that have not seen uh, the former episode or the series, then it would be great to learn more about Kitopi, like uh, what um, what's your mission, what's the story behind, and it would be great to learn a bit more so that we can uh, cover the basics and dig more uh, afterwards. Uh, absolutely. Thanks again for having me here. I, I really enjoyed that that yeah. conversation last last time. I think it was about a year and a half ago. Yeah. So um, uh, a lot has changed since then, uh, but the mission remains the same. We're on a mission to satisfy the world's appetite. Um, now, what has changed is previously, the way I would have described this over to you, Otto said we're on a mission to satisfy the world's appetite, and we're doing this by scaling food through our network of cloud kitchens. I would have emphasized our cloud kitchens, right? Today, I tell you our multi-brand restaurants. And, and, and that shift happened because over, over the course of our learnings, we, we realized we were restricting ourselves by just narrowing down our focus only on food delivery orders. When in fact, the customers do want that, that food accessible offline as well for takeaway, takeout, or, or just for fast casual dining. So uh, in that sense, the, the infrastructure has evolved into a hybrid infrastructure where you do have cloud kitchens in the back, but you also have an offline channel of QSR and takeouts. So it doesn't mean that you are now uh, in a, let's say, offline business of a regular restaurant where there's uh, this combination between, uh, you know, a regular restaurants as we know it, plus uh, this uh, delivery chain or uh, ordering out of home uh, option. Yeah, so in the sense that we do cater to both customers, offline and online, yes, in that sense. But what we've done very different is the consolidation of these restaurants. Okay. Now, uh, it, to the biggest issue with this industry was that the, ser the food service sector is very, very large. And the online channel of food delivery is growing very, very fast, but it's still a relatively small percentage of that overall overall area. How did pandemia and uh, you know the current crisis, uh, economic crisis that we we see, is affecting those trends? Like, are the people more keen to uh, order still from Absolutely. home, or more uh, like uh, you know like des desire to go out and? Uh, and try um, spay, spay, spend time more in the physical space. So, so the pandemic accelerated that behavior of ordering online, which is still a very, very low penetration. It's about 10 to 15% of the whole food service sector. Mm -hmm. So that acceleration occurred. Now, yeah, as soon as the lockdown opened up, people wanted to go out in the same sense. But food delivery orders remain on the rise. And, and a big part of what we've done as, as Katopi is a lot of those businesses were operating in silo. And what we've done is we've consolidated all, and, and we've been able to demonstrate a larger amount of efficiency by consolidating the entire operations across, across those businesses. So s since we last spoke, we've grown to 200 kitchens. We have over 200 brands. We're in five markets. Um, headquartered out of Dubai in the UAE. Still um, mostly Middle East, or uh, have you expanded also to other markets? No, we're MENA focused as of today. Okay. And there's so much depth in the MENA region um, uh, yeah. that there is so much room for growth where, where we are. Okay. Uh, but you once mentioned some expansion plans to, to Asia. Is that still on, on the agenda? or? So, you know, we never say never, but um, especially today with the economic landscape, um, um, and, and how things, we want to be very responsible about that, that growth plan. 
And the fact of the matter is there's just so much depth in our existing markets. I mean, we, we're in single digit penetrations in terms of percentage. And there's so much room to grow where we are. And in many ways, that's easier growth for us because you're, you're leveraging an existing base. But at some point, as we do continue to expand, yeah, we do want to revisit expanding outside the MENA region as well. Okay. And uh, can you tell me, you know, how is the technology developing or what uh, differentiates you from other players on the market? Are there any other players? So, like, I know that you are the lead, one of the leaders in that space, but are there any uh, competitors that you, uh, you're facing uh, or, um, you know, how's the technology of yours uh, different from what other, others are offering? So the, the technology we invest in is a critical, critical part to our ability to expand fast and to operate efficiency. Our, what our technology seeks to, as a, as a purpose, is really to elevate the customer experience, right, while driving efficiency. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, are there others in the market? Look, the, the cloud kitchen saw a big buzz. There were a lot of cloud kitchen players that opened up everywhere. But I think what distinguishes us is we've really tailored our technology across multiple brands in a single kitchen that remains true today. And we're just really tailoring it even further to, to, to our needs and to our customers' needs. Uh, you know, if we're talking about the technology, uh, Krakow uh, Tech Hub uh, plays a very important role uh, on that roadmap. So can you tell us, you're now 100 plus engineers here in Krakow, uh, what type of qualities you value the most and how you assess, uh, you know, the, the, the quality of uh, engineers here? So building out the Tech Hub out of Poland was probably one of the best decisions we made. Um, uh, I'm why? Glad to hear. <laughs> yeah, why? I'd say, uh, well, first and foremost, on the most basic level, the engineers are just amazing, great coders. Let's let's just start there. Um, and that's and if that's not enough, what has shown to be a massive asset are the personality traits. Um, uh, our engineers critique hard, really hard. Um, you know, I just I think of yesterday in terms of of how hard they critique, and that has shown to to ensure that we we solve the right problems, um, uh, we we harden our products in the right in the right way, and uh, and it makes us better for it. Um, yeah, I still remember how shocked you were, uh, the, the, what type of culture shock that was when you first met uh, some of the engineers uh, in Warsaw during your first uh, visits in Poland and uh, how they were, uh, let's say, uh, challenging or your uh, ideas, product, uh, roadmap, etc. Yeah, it was so, a culture shock. <laughs> exactly. So I wonder, because now you're, uh, you're having several offices in, in the Middle East, you have a very big office here in Krakow. And, uh, I've also learned that you established a new office in Denmark. So, mm -hmm. how yeah. are you managing all those uh, culture Difficult. differences within the team, and whether this uh, acts to your advantage, or uh, how how do you shape this people culture uh, in such a differentiated and diverse environment? Look, it's a very good question. Um, uh, our, our team in Denmark is still relatively small. We we started uh, earlier this year. There there are about five people as of now, but. Uh, you know, you, you have your company culture that you're trying to build, and you, you 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 hope that that culture transcends all locations, right? But there is a national culture that is very real, and the best you can do is really blend your company's culture with it. Working with Danish people now, and you know, and uh, Polish, and then across across the Middle East, yeah, they're they're very different. There, there's lots of differences. There are some similarities as well. Can you, can you, can you well. tell us or like the main differentiation? So, like like in in Denmark, for example, I've learned in, in the hard way, right? It, what you know, um, they can be very very clear and direct about what they will and will not do, right? So I, I remember we have our technical our head of uh, technical robotics, uh, Ricky. I, I absolutely adore him. And when we were starting our relationship, um, I had a bit of a, you know, I have a startup mindset and, and it's quite common for me for people to work outside of their boundaries and yeah, their, their core have, disciplines. It's amazing a history of entrepreneurship. Like I, mm. I always like, I like to hear about how it all, um, uh, also started for Kitopi, like, uh, what the value, uh, it was for your co-founders to, to have you on board, uh, and to learn from also your pre previous experiences as an entrepreneur. So, yeah. um, I believe that this is also some, uh, important factor. 
culture in a co company sure. culture that you already have those former so, so I'm used to people working outside of a certain boundary. So when I met Ricky, Ricky was very clear about, I will focus on the technical and the robotics and I will not do A, B, C, D, E, F, G and everything outside of it. Awesome. You know, by the end of the session, I'm like, please, can you just go to the mailbox and pick up the mail? And, uh, <laughs> and it, but you know, it made the conversation better because I understood right after that, that this is a domain, this is where he's going to focus. And if anything, it managed, it sets the right expectations. Um, uh, so I, I learned that. I also noticed that they're very optimistic people. I found very optimistic, um, uh, but not, but at least our team doesn't express it with enthusiasm, right? Like I, I was just there right before, uh, before my trip to Poland. And um, I was looking at all the robotics that was maturing and manifesting. And I was literally jumping up and down in excitement, okay. right? I was so excited. And they were more like, Yep, we can get that done. Yes. Yep, it's going to work, right? And but, I was like, that's, that's, that's true. I also work a bit with uh, Danish uh, clients, and uh, I also have that uh, feeling about this mentality that they're uh, not uh, so emotional as, as other, <laughs> let's say. I've, I've also learned that uh, they prefer recognition and praise more privately, at least my team, right? And wide recognition isn't as comfortable. These are, and again, I don't know how much of it is, is nationalistic culture and how much of it is just my, my team, yeah. but I, I've become more, I'll say, conscious and aware of it to really find a, a leadership style that ensures that I work well and, and bring the best out of, out of people. And I feel we've, we've done a decent job. Here in Poland, I, I, I have to acknowledge that uh, a, a big part of, of our ability to do this well was my, my VP of engineering. His name is Marcin. Yeah, and no. uh, and he, he yeah. helped really show me that, that way and how's the best way to communicate with, with the team here and to get the most value out of them. Yes, uh, so uh, I, I'm sure that uh, it's always great to have this type of key person here on site to uh, to supervise uh, when you're just uh, you know, uh, watching everything remotely, mm -hmm. right? So um, I don't know. Uh, do you uh, do you because there's like a lot of uh, things that. Uh, it, let's say improved according to to your growth um, in the in the recent months, uh, especially uh, the the recent uh, series round that you that you had. Uh, because when we met, uh, that was around uh, B series, sixty million uh, of US dollars uh, on the account, and now it's uh, like the the C round was uh, four hundred million, and I read that it has been extended with another three hundred uh, million, and you became a unit unicorn with uh, 1.55 uh, billions of US dollars of evaluation. So, um, you know, this, it, in, on one hand, it's probably uh, causing some uh, challenges if it comes to growing the company, but, uh, but on the other hand, you probably have some bold plans ahead of you. So it would be great to understand where you are heading and uh, how you um, we're uh, also structuring or restructuring uh, your processes um, at, at, you know, because of that uh, massive round. Like when you raise so much money like that, there's a sheer sense of responsibility to do what's right with it. So we, we've been very fortunate that we've had amazing investors that trusted us to, to really pursue our mission. And, yes, how uh, it is to have SoftBank uh, venture fund. And then they've been absolutely your... awesome. And they've been absolutely awesome. They're they're super. You know, they they're very resourceful. They they they, they give us what we need. Um, uh, we 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 raise problems. They help us solve them. So in, in general, we, we have a really good mix of investors overall. And that's been very very helpful. What are we doing? We're we're, we're persevering with our mission. I'd say first and foremost, we're on the tech side. We're maturing. Our production model. This is we're at an exciting moment where this production model is the combination of great software and now hardware and robotics, which is going to bring our efficiency levels to new heights where we're going to okay, optimize so labor efficiency. Can you tell us like how you are utilizing robots for? So I'm the aim in, in in robotics, our goal is to is to uh, automate a lot of the repetitive tasks within the kitchen. We refer to these as in-kitchen logistics. A lot of people hear us doing robotics, they go, oh, are they gonna quickly start automating the cooking of food? I'm sure that's what darted to, to, to your mind. But that's not what we're focusing on. And there are loads of great players working in that space. And we're simply looking at the ones that are maturing to, to a more functional solution and we'll, we'll adopt them. We're focusing on the movement of food within it. So everything to do with identifying the foods, sorting it, 
packing it, dispatching it to a driver, those workflows, you know, which is close to, to uh, 15 to 20% of our labor in our, in our latest version of, of our kitchens, um, that can be automated. And I love that, that, that those tech stacks, you know, those solutions are available in the market. They just need to be tailored to a different format. And that's what we've decided to, to focus our effort in. Uh, this is definitely a trend because uh, I'm also operating uh, with one the, of the company that I work with in uh, this uh, more, uh, you know, digital space where we create like even digital twins of a particular physical spaces. And I, mm -hmm. I see a lot of trends related to this automation of the repeatable processes and also, you know, uh, let's say monitoring of uh, some logistics process in order to improve it. So so I, I, I definitely follow what you're saying. Um, OK, so can you tell us like what would be the role of the Krakow Hub on this uh, further journey? And uh, if like what's the ambition goal? Uh, you're, I'd say ambitious goal uh, to achieve for the next, I don't know, one year or two years uh, to come. So uh, um, the role of our team here in Krakow over the next two years is to really mature our operating system, our, our what we call SCOS, our smart kitchen operating system. And um, there's a lot we're doing on, we're in the shift of moving from a startup to a scale up. So there's a lot that's being done on the compliance front. But beyond that, we're also taking the efficiency in the kitchen to whole new levels. We're doing a lot of great things with data um, uh, in, in the sense of how to meal plan orders in, in a much more productive way. And really on the, on the focus of optimizing our labor costs, but first and foremost, elevating the customer experience. So you know, where there is a complaint, there is an opportunity to find a way to use technology to eliminate that. And on, the, on, a, on another note, we're also looking to delight customers and using data to, to create a more personalized experience to, to anyone that orders from us, irrespective of the channel they order from us, to ensure that we delight you with, with orders, with, with menu items that we know you would like and, and, and to complement them and to really just drive uh, loyalty. What were the critical success factors on your journey so far? And uh, how have you managed to uh, become a unicorn within three years? Uh, so if you were to give some tips to, to other uh, founders or uh, and highlight something that was uh, done properly on your journey and, or which or what type of factors uh, have influenced the most, and it, that would be great for us to hear. So it's a really great question. So a few things come to my mind. Um, First is solving the right problem. I think we, we made a very good decision in, in selecting the right problem to solve. This is a, it's a very big market and the, the food delivery um, uh, industry has a lot of problems and a lot of issues and it's also in big demand and it's in growing. So I think selecting the right problem is, is probably the, thing, the first thing that an entrepreneur should obsess over. Problem, 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 problem. Um, uh, and then second to that is this notion of being focused, right? We actually, our, our last uh, annual KitCon, what we call KitCon, our annual um, uh, company event, oh. was themed focus, right? Because quite often what happens, especially when you, when you raise such large rounds, is you get distracted, you know? So picture us, we're in the food industry. And... Um, while we were growing, we, you get a lot of ideas, right? We do this, why don't you also do that? We have a supply chain, why don't we also serve businesses? Um, uh, we have food, let's open up a grocery store. We have a lot of brands, why don't you be an aggregator? And sometimes these ideas can be tempting to the thought, but if you engage them, and especially if you engage them too early, they can really derail you. Um, uh, they can derail you to the point of no return. Do you feel any pressure, I don't know, from uh, the, your current investors into uh, selecting this type of no, roadmap no, now? No, no. I feel like, I, I, I think we've had the good fortune of having investors who have been very supportive of the choices that we've made. Um, they guide, they consult, um, but they don't tell us you have to go there, you gotta, go, you gotta do this. Um, uh, so, and throughout that journey with focus, we've been distracted. There have been moments where we tried this, or you know, pandemic happened. Let's try a new grocery store. So, so it does happen. But I think we've we've done a good job with um, re refocusing 
when, when those issues happen relatively fast. So that's, that's I'll say, second, third, team, 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 team. You know, yes, people create, so, create great businesses, you know, people solve great problems. Um, uh, and depending on what sort of runway you have as, a, as an entrepreneur, you might not have the luxury of making a lot of mistakes with the selection of, of your team. So you've got to be very careful. You've got to make sure that team is the right, the right competence, um, the right skill sets, the right mix of skill sets. Um, uh, you need like-minded but different thinkers, right, to, to give you different perspectives. Um, uh, so that's uh, that's a third thing I would emphasize, and uh, a fourth would be culture. They say you know they say uh, culture eats strategy for breakfast. It's a, it's a famous <laughs> quote, and I can't agree with that anymore. Um, uh, it is very, very, very important that you ensure that your team share some value. That usually it comes in the form of, of values and you need to PR your values and, and demonstrate them and role model them in every shape and form. So very, very important part because it brings everything thing together. On a personal note, I can say what has helped and I, I, I would say probably the leadership team you know, shares this as well, is, is we've had to reinvent ourselves across, across this journey. The version of me from year one is not the same version of year two and year three and year four. And, That's, um, good. That's good because yeah. you are growing with, uh, together with the company. So yeah, because what, what, what you did then to get you there isn't necessarily what's going to get you to, to the next level. And, and really maturing that mindset and understanding what works and, and, and making great decisions. That's an, essentially what it's all about, making good decisions, is, is something that you literally need to configure to depending on the stage your business is in. Yeah, so again, like we could talk uh, hours uh, and uh, I still feel that we haven't saturated uh, the topic. So thank you so much for uh, dedicating some time during your short trip uh, here to Krakow. And uh, I'm, I'm, I, I want to give you some space for bonding with your team uh, here in Krakow so that you can, uh, you know, improve this um, company culture still and, and build it um, personally here. So uh, thank you so much for being our guest and uh, I hope uh, you will uh, be in other episodes in the future uh, and uh, accept our invitation uh, next time. So uh, I most you. definitely will. Yeah. Thank, thanks for having thanks. me again. Thank you so much. Enjoy. Take care.